Hi everyone, welcome to my follow-up video about Stephen Wolfram. I've combed through the videos he's posted about a new kind of science. He did a very long series celebrating the 20th anniversary of the book in May. I'm not looking at the specific findings of the book or the videos, I'm looking at the bigger picture. I want to know the philosophical underpinnings of what he's doing, and this is the computational paradigm he's talking about. And in a sense, his metaphysics is very simple. It's all based on the principle of computational equivalence. But of course, it's not just a matter of understanding that principle alone. I'll let him explain to you in this clip here. People say, there's this principle, and can I nail it down to you know, prove a traditional mathematical theorem about this principle? Here's the thing to understand about a principle like this, and it applies to many of these general principles in science, like natural selection, like other kinds of things. The principle, almost, by the time you have really embraced the paradigm, the principle becomes almost trivial. It becomes almost self-evident. It, it has, that doesn't mean it doesn't have content, but it means that it is the sort of the core of this paradigm. And it is something that once you have kind of um, uh, absorbed it, it gives you intuition about a zillion other things. It, it gives you a framework for thinking about things, um, much as in, in an area like biology or economics or whatever, there are paradigmatic ways of thinking about things. It is the paradigmatic way of thinking about things in the foundations of, of, computa of the computational view of the world. It's the kind of, it's the foundational principle for computational X, for the computational view of everything. So, and as a foundational principle, it is incredibly important and valuable as a way to sort of drive understanding intellectual frameworks and so on. When you try and nail it down, it is not a very, it, it, it isn't natural to it to be kept in a zoo, so to speak. It's not natural to be pinned down to the particular way that you set you describe things in let's say set theory it will be a it will be a you know you'll have to contort that big intellectual principle into this little thing that fits in the aquarium or something and as you do that you may learn a whole bunch about that principle and how it works but sometimes the oh look it doesn't fit in that corner of the aquarium um so it can't be true isn't a correct conclusion it's it's a consequence of the fact that that aquarium was built using a different framework than the one that that the principle of computational equivalence, in a sense, uh, it underlies. We need to embrace the computational paradigm before the principle of computational equivalence will make sense. Or to use Wolfram's terms, we need to get to a new aquarium. And that's what I'm trying to do in this video. This is a metaphysical challenge. It's not a scientific uh, task. So. He has a blog post from September where he's outlining these different paradigms. Uh, I don't buy this fourth one here. I think Wolfram's jumping the shark. I think this is all part of the same thing. The principle of computational equivalence applies to both. So I'll be treating that as one. And this is a thumbnail from my first video. It's about intuition because we need to change on the inside first before all this stuff will make sense, what Wolfram's talking about. You can't just hand someone a new framework of ideas and expect it to work. There's a bigger question here. So I think the key to understanding Wolfram's talk about the principle is to look at Aristotle's metaphysics. In book six, Aristotle claims that there's three kinds of theoretical science, physics, mathematics, and then some general third science. He calls it theology, but he also names it first philosophy and wisdom and the science of being qua being. I'm going to stick with theology for this video and you'll see why later on. Wolfram's term for this third science is ruleology. That's his definition there from last September, the pure basic science of what simple rules do. And the best example that he has, and I think it is great, is Rule 30. It's a rule listed here, a set of instructions, if you will, that runs through a computer and produces this model. And the importance of this Rule 30 cannot be underestimated. You do this experiment in the computational universe, 
and you discover these things that are really very surprising, you didn't expect were there. Now you have to kind of reset your intuition to encompass what you now know is true. And in a sense, it was that effort to reset one's intuition that was the foundation for the science and new kind of science and the basis for a lot of work that's been done since then, ultimately the basis for things like our physics project and all the things that are emerging from that. All of that came from this one observation that came out of this, in the end, best summarized by this one rule, this rule 30 cellular automaton. It's it's so much my favorite discovery that like on, um, uh, on my uh, business card, I, I have a, a nice rule 30 on the back and a, and a rule 30 embossed on the front. Um, just in case I'm, I'm chatting with someone and it's like, you know, there's this rule 30 thing. And um, uh, it's like, it's very hard to describe because it's like, well, you, you kind of get, um, uh, you run a program and it does this thing that you don't expect it to do. So you kind of have to see it do it. Is that a gram? New card. What do you think? Whoa, very nice. Look at that. Picked them up from the printers yesterday. Good coloring. That's rule 30. And the lettering is something called Cillian Braille. I couldn't resist making that meme a little bit of uh, American Psycho. Ruleology is simple. It is the pure basic science of what simple rules do, but there's more to it. Wolfram is talking about programs, and he also talks about models. So I propose this as a general sort of extrapolation of what ruleology is. Rules are run as programs, and the programs make models. The models show what the rules mean or symbolize. And all of that takes place inside of what's known as the Ruliad, which is the limit of all possible computations. I'll be coming back to the Ruliad later. But first I want to look at this idea of programs because the word itself implies a computer. It's like a software program, but that's a little bit misleading. So with programs, they have the misfortune in a sense to actually be implementable explicitly on computers. So it then becomes the question of when you have a program-based model, maybe you might say there's got to be a computer running it. But actually, programs are a much more abstract concept, just like mathematical equations. They're something which abstractly can be discussed, abstractly exists, abstractly can be studied, and you don't have to say, on what computer did you happen to run that? You might choose to run it on a particular computer to do some simulation, but that's not intrinsic to the model itself. So using rule 30 as an example, this is the rule, and you run this rule on a program that makes the model, model 30, shown here. So this is the standard kind of image for it, but if you run it for 2,000 iterations, you get something like this. And you do need a computer to get this. Doing it by hand would be obscene, but the computer is not necessary. It has a function, but it's not necessary for the program to run, so to speak. Uh, it's something more abstract. For our purposes, programs are only useful in terms of creating models. And the models are useful in terms of understanding the rules. So I clarify this a little bit here. Simple rules are run as abstract programs, which make ideal models. One question is, when you do modeling, what does it mean? What is it, what is it, uh, what's involved in doing modeling? And the thing to understand is that when you make a model of something, you are somehow idealizing the thing. You are capturing certain essential features of the thing that you want to describe, and you're ignoring other kinds of things. So when you make a model of things, you're not trying to say where every individual atom goes. You're trying to say the things that you care about, the features that you care about, can you reproduce those features? And the thing that I consider to be the most important and one of the contributions of a new kind of science is this idea of sort of drilling down from a potentially very complex phenomenon to see the essence of what it is that sort of the essential mechanism that produces some kind of behavior, but potentially complex behavior. So based on this iterative process, right, this is a repeating process within the Ruliad. I'm going to show you Ruliology from the 1600s. This is done by a man named Robert Flood. If you've watched my other videos, you will have seen some of his images before. 
And I want to mention that my work on Flood comes from Wolfgang Pauli. It's based on this essay that he wrote in 1952. And there's a whole story there about quantum physics and how we have to go back to the history of science to kind of figure out what went wrong. But for now, I'll just be using Flood's images as an example of ruleology from the 1600s. Again, this is all an effort to get into the right aquarium in which the principle of computational equivalence makes sense and becomes obvious to us. Now, Flood emphasized images in his books. This is the cover of his main work. It's called A Physical, Metaphysical, and Technical History of the Macro and Microcosmos. So it is a work of cosmology. And Flood was explicit in the sense that he had to use images. He had to have these hieroglyphic illustrations to show his readers the cosmology, the structure of the cosmos. You might think that sort of using just your eyes to tell you something is somehow unscientific and that, no, 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 we have to turn everything into numbers and that's the only way we can be scientific. But actually, one of the things that sort of a meta lesson of a new kind of science is that one's eyes are useful. One's eyes have the sort of highest data rate that gets into our brains right now for, for kind of things we can tell what's going on. And that it's visualization and being able to sort of see things and, and uh, come to conclusions just with one's eyes is really important. One can then sort of back that up with various kinds of computational and mathematical and numerical and whatever methods, although sometimes they won't get that far and one's eyes still have it, so to speak. So in this sequence of images, Flood seems to be showing us um, recursion. He starts with this layout here and these two pyramids are kind of like the rule of the model. The numbers I've put on here come from the next image in the sequence. It's this one here. You can see the formal pyramid below the material one is based outside of the entire system, outside of these spheres. That number four is in the space that surrounds the page. And that's what I call the formal four or in four, oh, sorry, out four <laughs> is the, the formal four. And then as you move closer to the center, the out numbers are the formal numbers, they decrease. And at the very center is the in four. So taking that scheme and then applying it to the next image, you can see how each section or each region has now become further subdivided. It's become like the entire cosmos itself. And if you line up all three of these images in a row, Flood seems to be demonstrating recursion within the cosmos, creating this structure here. And I think this works in terms of time as a progress of computation, but again, without a computer, right? How do you show the program without a computer to run it? Um, how do you show the, the change over time of the model, right? I think this is an attempt to do that. And you might say, well, okay, it's interesting, but what, so what? What does it mean? Um, well, it can mean a lot, right? This is complexity from simplicity. This is one of the primary roots of the intuition that Wolfram's talking about. These are some diagrams I made back when I was a graduate student. Uh, if you expand out the pyramids, you get this kind of mirroring structure. The plurality and totality ideas come from Kant's categories of judgment according to quantities. And I was exploring this and kind of trying to come up with this model of analysis and synthesis or resolution and composition. Resolution is when you find truth relative to meaning or within meaning. Uh, it's like clarifying what you already know. But synthetic truth or composition is ampliative, to use Kant's term. It actually adds to our knowledge of the world. It's a lot more difficult to reach it, though. So this is my understanding of ruleology. <laughs> this is how I explore computational reducibility within the ruleade, our, our slice of it, which raises the question of what the ruleade is. In this ruleade, this, this sort of entangled limit of all possible computations, there's a lot of wild stuff going on, but we as human observers with bounded, uh, where we have sort of bounded computational abilities, we have this idea that we're persistent through time, even though our underlying structure may be continually updating itself. We have this idea that we persist through time. Those two things are enough to constrain 
those as which aspects of this Rouliad of all, all possible computations we actually observe. And that slice that we are capable of observing is a particular slice. And that particular slice has more characteristics that are like mathematics than that are like the things we've talked about as mathematics than perhaps I had realized before. And sort of the big thing that comes about is the realization that our mathematics is also based on this Rouliad idea. And the mathematics that we have is also based on kind of our ability to observe the Rouliad. Our physics is based on our ability to observe the Rouliad. Our mathematics is based on our ability to observe the Rouliad. But it's the same us that's doing the observation in the two cases. And so that means that there are constraints that are associated with our particular uh, characteristics, like computational bounded, like this notion of persistence through time, that apply themselves both in physics and in mathematics. So lately, Wolfram has been talking about EMES, E-M-E-S, as the raw material of the Rouliad. These images here would be my candidates for that. Um, I've talked about these pictures in other videos. This one's from Flood. This one's from Buckminster Fuller. And it's a good discussion to have, but here's my problem with that. If you don't already have the computational paradigm in view, if you're not in the right aquarium, then talking about Eames is pointless. It's not going to help you. That's why I resort to Aristotle's metaphysics in terms of theology. Aristotle writes, it's obvious that if the divine is present anywhere, it's present in things of this sort, meaning things of the sort that combine physics and mathematics in this third category of theoretical science. So if someone looks at this and they're not aware of the computational paradigm, they're not going to feel that this has anything to do with divinity whatsoever. It's not obvious that this is a model of anything besides some kind of rudimentary logical system. Now, compare these images to this image, um, which is from Flood's book as well. Now it's like, okay, I see how this is related to divinity in some way. It's almost like a, a picture from, from a church or an illustration that you'd see in a religious book. The thing with Flood's cosmology is that that doesn't sacrifice the scientific integrity, let's say, or the, the logical consistency of the system is not gone. If we just take a closer look at this image, these are units of culture, by the way. I'd much rather talk about memes than Eames uh, in terms of cultural evolution, but that, again, is another discussion. The thing I want to focus on right now is up here. This is the Tetragrammaton. It's a four-letter word for God, Yahweh in Hebrew, and that is our slice of the Ruliad. The function that this plays in Flood's cosmology is the same as the function of the Ruliad in Wolfram's metaphysics. And Wolfram's gotten pretty close to recognizing this for himself, too. He almost makes the, the realization alive. So then, the sort of the big thing that came along was monotheism, um, that, you know, roll them all together into one god type thing. There's a certain sense in which that has a resonance with the principle of computational equivalence of roll together all those special purpose computations that happen in all these different uh, venues into this one kind of global thing, the, the sort of the global idea of computation as a, as a single concept and, and ultimately leads to things like the Rouliad. Um, I hadn't really thought about it that way before, but... So where this really becomes interesting is in the concept of human recursion. Uh, here's a model of us with the tetragrammaton outside. You can see the letters A, B, C, and D, which form uh, the complete logical judgment according to the four Hebrew characters. Now, if you think of these ideas here, there's imagination, intellect, the senses, as the computational boundedness of the human observer then this is a model of us showing us the rules that run the program that has created the model of us. And you can see how this turns into an iterative process that almost makes the model real or experiential. It's like a, an experience of inner transformation that's meant to occur. And you might say, well, then it's no longer ruleology because the model has to be ideal. And yes, you're right. But when it comes to the ultimate model of the universe, Wolfram will tell us that we lose that idealization and the model does become real. 
I look at this thing, and when I look inside the model, the mechanism of the model agrees with the mechanism of the system itself. That's essentially another level of modeling. Do you get just the output? You'll never get all the mechanism the same, because obviously your model is just an idealization of the system itself. So the mechanism of the model will never be identical to the mechanism of the system itself. By the way, I should put a footnote on all of these things. All of the things I'm saying about modeling here and idealization are true until you come to the ultimate model, the model of fundamental physics, the model of the universe, which, of course, we've now been working on very intensively for the last couple of years. And for that model, I will not say that what one's dealing with is an idealization of what's going on. What one's dealing with is the low level of what's actually going on sort of all the way down. It's, it's computation kind of all the way down. So Flood tries to show this idea of computation all the way down in these images. We have a tetragrammaton laid out as a tetractus in this case, one, two, three, four, which is really quite an elegant way to show it. And this emanation that kind of culminates in the created world. But you might be wondering here why I'm so convinced of this connection between Flood and Wolfram or how such a thing would even be possible. And the best answer I have right now is that they are both quaternarian thinkers as opposed to trinitarian thinkers. And that distinction comes from Carl Jung's essay on the psychological dogma of the Trinity. In general, though, quaternarian thinkers tend to exaggerate. They tend to have this idea of universal knowledge and intuition of everything with no bounds, no limits. The important thing though, is that that's not their only characteristic. It's just that they're emphasizing that aspect of human psychology. We all have that within us. And there's a need to reconcile that intuition with more temperate or moderate kind of ways of understanding. Um, as an example here, these are Kant's categories, which are arranged in four groups of three. This is Hegel's triangle diagram from his notebook, four triangles. So I see these as attempts to reconcile the Trinitarian and Quaternarian psychological forces, let's say. And people like Flood and Wolfram and Buckminster Fuller, who is a fantastic Quaternarian thinker, are simply emphasizing the four groups or the four categories. Whereas Trinitarian thinkers like uh, Johannes Kepler is a good example. They're more focused on the fact that each of those categories has within it three things or three subcategories. But now that we know that Wolfram is a quaternarian thinker and that he tends towards this universal knowledge idea, we're prepared to grasp or, or face, let's say, the principle of computational equivalence. The principle of computational equivalence is both telling us that, yes, our level of computational sophistication, the one that is embodied in us humans, that's the same as the level for the whole universe. We have it. We know, we can know, we can have a conception of the computational processes of the whole universe. It's not the case that, that there's, oh, there's humans, and then there's much bigger, there's the universe, and it's got a level of computational sophistication way beyond us humans. That's what people in physics, for example, had thought, uh, probably until pretty recently, actually, certainly in the 1980s, that's what they thought, that, um, uh, uh, that, that kind of physics was something that fundamentally wasn't like a Turing machine, it wasn't computational. Um, and that's something that now with our physics project, we can start to see it really is true. Physics is computational all the way down. So. It's, but the principle of computational equivalence already tells us it is a principle. It is a, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a bold principle that went out and said at the time of the NKS book, this is how the world works. The principle of computational equivalence is true. And that means that one of its implications is there's nothing about the universe that is computationally beyond us. So it, it encapsulates, as I say here, both the ultimate power and the ultimate weakness of science. The ultimate power of science in the sense that there is a thing, computation, embodied in the principle of computational equivalence that is our way of describing the universe. We can successfully describe the whole universe. There is not a mystical force in the universe that is beyond 
what we can describe with this kind of computational methodology. On the other hand, it also encapsulates the ultimate weakness of science, because it tells us while we can in principle break the universe down into this kind of computational components, we can't say based on that, you might have said, oh, we know what the components of the universe are. Great, we solved it, we have it, we know the, everything about the universe. Not true because of computational irreducibility, because we need then to have this idea that, in, in, uh, that we have to kind of live through time we have to actually uh, see the computational progress of things. We can't jump ahead and just say, and the answer is this. So that's the sense in which it encapsulates the ultimate weakness of science. Because if we believe in science as being the thing that allows us to get beyond what's happening in nature, this, does, this tells us that we won't in general be able to do that. So this is Flood's monochord of the world. It was designed with polemical intent against Kepler. And there's so much going on here, you think that Flood would have benefited from a computer to run this program and really show his readers the model that he had in his mind. Now, Marine Mersenne, a French philosopher, accused Flood of black magic and heresy, which is interesting. And I talk about that in my published article about Flood, and I'll put a link to that in the description. But what Wolfram is telling us here with the principle of computational equivalence is that we have always been able to see this as a weakness of science because since the 1600s, science has defined itself in terms of rejecting this model and rejecting the kind of thinking that would produce this kind of model. Now, when we're looking at the strength of science, we realize, oh, we can't actually hold that against flood or hold that against this model and that there is science involved here. But the problem is that that creates a kind of identity crisis for science. How will science define itself if it is forced to accept things like this? And if skepticism is no longer justified in regards to this way of thinking, it is definitely closely tied to the meaning crisis that John Verveke talks about. But for Wolfram, it shows the fundamentally anarchist energy of the principle of computational equivalence and that it's really eating science from the inside. But it's a crucial philosophical and conceptual point that I think is slowly beginning to seep into general awareness. But it is, in a sense, one of the more important, most important conclusions, I suppose, for, for general philosophy in of the NKS book is science has limitations. And those limitations are eating science from the inside. It's not like one's coming and saying, oh, actually, there's this thing, it's, a, it's theology or it's, it's something super science from outside of science. And, you know, you've got to pay attention to that. It's coming from outside of science. No, this is something from inside science itself. It is science eating itself from the inside. It is this idea of, of the principle of computational equivalence, computational irreducibility. These are things that emerge from within the canon of science itself and show the limitations of science. Now, in a sense, there was a long prodrome to this from Gödel's theorem and things like that, but the interpretation, the kind of knitting that together with what that means for science, that's one of the big contributions of the NKS book, I think. So Wolfram's absolutely right. There's been a very long buildup to this point. Uh, in 1976, Lyotard wrote, postmodern science concerns itself with undecidables, the limits of precise control, conflicts of incomplete information, fracta, catastrophes, paradoxes, and that this indicates that science is theorizing its own future as one of self-destruction. It's changing the meaning of the word knowledge while expressing how such a change can take place. It's producing not the known, but the unknown. And it suggests a model of legitimation that has nothing to do with maximized performance, but has as its basis Difference understood as paralogy. My take on this is that synchronicity is the model of legitimation by paralogy. And that, of course, comes from the Pauli Young conjecture. In that conjecture, psychology takes the place of math, uh, according to Aristotle's metaphysics. And this third science, this third reality, is something that justifies synchronicity or makes it possible, perhaps, which would be a theory of uh, psychophysical parallelism. I think Wolfram is reaching this point. Uh, he's recognizing that the computational boundedness of the human observer is paramount to ruleology. 
And this image comes from Flood's book as well. It's a man praying to the Tetragrammaton. I will sing in the shadow of your wings. I'm not saying that Wolfram is telling us to pray, right? But this has something to do with human psychology more than math or physics, even though the Tetragrammaton might be our slice of the Ruliad. So this raises the question of what people have found in history of the Ruliad or within it, um, if people understood what this meant before, how can we go back and recontextualize things that had been ignored and missed in the past? I think there's an optimism there, and this is why Wolfram is a magnetic thinker. People enjoy listening to him because he's optimistic. This post here he made a few days ago about colonizing rulial space, alien intelligence, and the concept of technology. Wolfram wants to go on a quest for discovery, which is great. I'm all for it. I think it might draw us further back into history than maybe he realizes right now. But I'm on board in terms of sort of seeing this not as the death of science, but as the start of something new. So I hope you learned something. If you have recommendations, please leave them in the comments. Thank you for watching.